We are joined by our senior advisor, the former acting director of national intelligence, Ambassador Rick Rennell. And Rick, I wanted to first go, before we get back to Russia, I wanted to let you explain, because you're on the broadcast Friday on the escalating tensions in Kosovo. There were three uh, police officers imprisoned, and things looked like it could escalate into more conflict, potentially. But you were able, uh, by making this trip into Kosovo, to get those officers released and a de-escalation started. So tell people about that. So I was sitting in Los Angeles watching the situation unfold, and it was really frustrating, Jordan, because uh, here in the northern part of Kosovo, where tensions are high and individuals are are screaming about, uh, you know, being forced into um, a situation that they don't like and no one's helping them and the emotions are high and the violence is getting out of control. So I decided um, to to reach out to the parties that I knew, and they were desperate for somebody to listen. And so I took I made the trip. I went to northern Kosovo uh, Wednesday to Saturday, just a quick trip. And on Thursday, I spent the day in a place in north Kosovo with about 20 of the Serb leaders there in Kosovo. And over the last six weeks, think about this, over the last six weeks, as emotions began to take over, violence began to unfold, uh, and NATO troops began to go in, not a single U.S. or European official in the last six weeks was willing to go and sit down and talk with the Serbs locally who were feeling this pressure. And so I did. I went, and uh, everybody told me not to go because it was dangerous. And I just thought, you know, I've been there before. This is ridiculous to, to think that it's dangerous. I went without security, and I sat down, walked the streets, uh, talked with 20 different Serb leaders there, and really pushed uh, the parties involved to uh, make a de-escalation move, and that was to release the Kosovo police, which are of Albanian descent. Um, I think the prime minister of Albania, Idi Rama, did an amazing job of pushing uh, the Serb government. Um, I was pushing, Viktor Orban was pushing, uh, but sadly, no American and no EU official was willing to go in. They were just sitting on the sidelines and complaining and trying to say, do something, do something. And it's frustrating for me to see American diplomacy not be brave and courageous. We're not a bunch of you know, tea-sipping, restaurant-going diplomats that like to sit around and go to nice places. We're supposed to go into dangerous zones. And as a guy who's no longer a diplomat, no, I have no affiliation with the US government, I just couldn't sit on the sidelines. From the private sector uh, standpoint, I think there's some things that can be done, and, and I went in and, and tried to help. Rick, let, let's. Get, I think this is important. You said this on the broadcast Friday, but I think it's important to reiterate this to our audience. And that is, why is this important to America's interest, our interest um, in this whole conflict? Well, first of all, we have uh, NATO troops there. Uh, the tradition has been a lot of Iowa National Guard, but uh, recently and right now is the Indiana National Guard. The Texas National Guard is getting ready to take over. And uh, this is a situation where Americans are paying for it. American men and women are serving there. And so our national security is, is intertwined. Obviously, we're a member of NATO, and so is Albania. And we have uh, treaty obligations to do things. And, and certainly, I'm not a, uh, suggesting that we should put more American troops in harm's way. Uh, when I was negotiating between Kosovo and Serbia, we had four agreements that were working out pretty well. And Jay, I had talked about pulling back our NATO troops, trying to save money, trying to save uh, American men and women from having to go serve in Kosovo because things were moving in the right direction. Over the last three years, it's moved completely in the wrong direction and we see what's been happening. Rick, I wanted to ask you, we've just got a new statement uh, from Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin from the Wagner Group who oversees the Wagner Group. And he said, uh, this was his explanation of what was going on when they were doing the march towards Moscow. He said it was to prevent the destruction of the Wagner private military company because they were facing strikes by Russian military and to bring justice to those who were unprofessional actions, trying to say it was directed really at military leadership, maybe not at Putin uh, directly saying that Putin's getting bad advice. He said they they stopped their march 
when it was obvious that there would be a lot of Russian blood shed and that they felt that they showed through their actions what they had the ability to do if the Russian government did not make the decisions that they wanted, that they could basically do this again. So they have not yet said through this statement that he would not do this again. He did also acknowledge uh, what Alexander Lukashenko extending a place for him to go next. We don't know if he's actually there in Belarus yet. But just your reaction to what occurred this weekend and where things stand right now in Russia. First of all, I've been cautioning lots of people to wait and let's see on how this plays out a little bit, because I think there's a lot of propaganda going around. Certainly, there's a power struggle within the Russian military. The, the uh, war in Ukraine is not going super well for the Russians. They thought they'd go in and crush it and get out. And that's not happening. So the Ukrainians are putting up a, a big fight. That's embarrassing for Putin. Uh, it's why Wagner, this private uh, military group, is is flexing its muscle. Um, I think they're proud of the Russian tradition and they want to win. And so there's a power grab and a power shuffling going on within the Russian military. I, look, that directly impacts Putin, whether he says that it does or not. When you can't have a winning military, when your military is is wrestling with your leadership decisions, when there's conflict from the leader saying you're not doing the right thing or we're not winning, I think that directly goes to Putin. But um, I, I never believed that this was going to be a, a huge crisis for Putin. I believed that he could always put it down fast. And that's exactly what he did. Most of the pundits were wrong. Um, but there's no question that this is uh, a conflict that continues internally within the Russian military, and they're going to have to get a handle on it. I have also said, and I've spent, again, a speculation, Rick, that when you're dealing with these things, you got to kind of, it's like nine dimensional chess. You got to kind of think three moves out. And there's a lot of geopolitics at play in this as well. And that is the Chinese were concerned about the way the war between Russia and Ukraine is going. The Europeans have a vested interest in this thing getting resolved. And does this domestic disturbance, let's call it that, uh, this attempted coup, whatever you want to call it, on Putin's, give Putin the chance to, to recalibrate? In other words, does he get to recalibrate and say, you know what, we've got a domestic issue now. I'm going to pull out of Ukraine because i got to solve the situation here as a safety, as basically an exit ramp. I've wondered if that's what it is. Or are some of the Middle East players at play in all this? Well, there's no question that something is going on. And that was my caution to so many pundits that were racing to talk about it. Uh, because when the Wagner group turns around quickly and says, oh, nothing to see here, and we've, we've solved it with, uh, with President Putin, something is at play. I mean, Putin clearly cut some sort of a deal, and we don't know what that is, and we don't know uh, how that will unfold. But clearly now, I think at, at the leadership level, there was an adjustment and they're coming together to figure out now how to, uh, you know, fight for the, the greatness of Russia. And so uh, I think we've got to watch it very closely and, and see how this unfolds. But I, I don't think it's over. I think that they're both going to want to follow through on whatever deal they cut. And uh, sometimes these deals are cut and you're not really talking about the same thing. You're talking over each other. And for the moment, you feel like there is some sort of a resolution, but uh, it remains to be seen if that holds. Yeah, we, we're still seeing a lot of social media posts from Wagner's official accounts that are very provocative, to say the least. Like, basically, one, uh, they've got their finger over their mouth, like a quiet sign, saying you don't tell, you might you might make one agreement, and it translates to, but you don't tell people your next plans. And so, and then Ukrainian soldiers started to put out the same image. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, interesting at play. I mean, I think that the, the long term here, Rick, is that, like you said, and for everybody listening, this is not over. Like, this, it may feel like it was over uh, quickly, but that there's obviously a lot of internal happenings going on in Russia. Whether that means Putin goes or not, it, it, you know, that that's one thing, but also the impact it might have. I was going to ask you this finally. It does seem like Russia would have a real problem if they don't have the Wagner Group fighting with them in Ukraine, even in some of the limited gains they've been able to make in Ukraine have bo mostly been because of Wagner. If they're not going to go fight, I mean, what does the Russian military do now that they they have not been effective at all? Look, I, I think you just hit, hit a huge headline that has not been talked about very much, which is Putin has to rely on uh, forces outside of the Russian military because the Russian military couldn't really cut it. Um, the Wagner Group is clearly helping them. Uh, they've got to be on the same page if they're going to have a win. And this latest development, I think, just signals 
that both sides feel like it's not going exactly the way they wanted it. Thank you for your work in Kosovo been able to de-escalate a situation. Amazing. We know that this administration has been so interested in letting things get out of control and lead to conflict and death and instead of peace through strength and just negotiations and work and bringing people together. I hope that those that are listening see the scope and nature of the work of the ACLJ. Rick, of course, is our uh, senior advisor on national security and international matters and talking about an international ma- matter that he just de-escalated, um, one of the great hot spots of the world right now. Your support to the ACLJ allows all of this to happen. 